sexual passion and reverence, piety, don't seem to have to do much with each other. When you hear the word reverence or piety, what is it that you think of? You think of being in church, kneeling, praying the rosary? Probably not the conjugal act between husband and wife. And yet, in both Dietrich von Hildebrand and in John Paul, they see an intimate and necessary needed connection between those two. I remember very distinctly how being struck by the intensity of piety in Dietrich von Hildebrand at retreats. There was an annual retreat that my parents went to and I went to later when I was in high school. Particularly when everybody prayed Veni Sancti Spiritus, Edemite Julitus, Lucis Tui Radium. There was an intensity, a kind of burning intensity in Dietrich von Hildebrand, which really struck me which was like what we experienced, my wife and I, when we went to Mass at John Paul in the chapel of the people residence. The intensity of his prayer expressed mostly in, in quiet, in size, and uh, was, was impressive, as if as if the whole weight of the world were on his shoulders. One had the sense that he was praying for the whole world. So what exactly is the relationship between sexual passion and reverence? Reverence taken in a broad sense that stretches from even our relation to plants, animals, especially to other human beings, all the way to the divine. It always has a note of the divine in it. Um, or is sebeia is the Greek term, pietas, but also reverentia, the Latin. Let me begin with two texts that draw the connection very closely, one by Hildebrand, the other by John Paul. The first is a very spirited defense of being in love, which you find in the book on marriage. Real being in love, even in its superficial form, that's very interesting, must never be confused with sensual desire. Very important. Erotic passion is deeper than simple please sense desire. It always involves the person deeply. Being in love always implies a respectful, chivalrous attitude toward the beloved. A certain element of humility even, a melting of the soul, of the rigidity of the ego. A person truly in love becomes tender and even pure. A little bit later, he speaks about uh, contraception and the role of reverence in one's attitude toward sexual union. To preserve the reverent attitude of the spouses toward the mystery of this union. It's a mysterious union. Reverence is appropriate. Not only sexual passion is appropriate, but it is the kind of passion that has a deep mystery in it, which calls for reverence. Toward the mystery of this union, this general connection between procreation and the communion of love must always be maintained, even subjectively. We had some fine distinctions made about this this morning by Janet. At least as a general possibility of this act, it is difficult to imagine a greater lack of reverence toward God than interfering with this mystery, with desecrating hands to frustrate this mystery. They are 
You see, the point of view from which he looks at the question of contraception, it is the point of view of sensitivity to a deep mystery that goes, that has a divine depth in it. Then from John Paul's Theology of the Body, a somewhat parallel passage, more theological. He's commenting on the exhortation of Paul in 1 Corinthians 6. In German, it's easy to remember, as the Corintha 6, because that's where he talks about sex. <laughs> Glorify God in your body. Is that a thought most people have when they experience erotic passion and act on it? Purity as a virtue or ability of keeping one's own body with holiness and reverence. So that's one aspect, keeping. It's a negative aspect. You don't do what is contrary. Allied with the gift of piety. We can also translate this as reverence. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. A sensibility for what is sacred. As a fruit of the Holy Spirit's dwelling in the temple of the body, causes in the body such a fullness of dignity in interpersonal relations that God Himself is thereby glorified. And then remarkable statements that I think are really the center of the spiritual vision of John Paul in the theology of the body. Purity is the glory of the human body before God. The word glory, it's very close to beauty. You could say glory is the beauty that belongs to God. It's big beauty. It's not just prettiness, but glory. It is the glory of God in the human body through which masculinity and femininity are manifested. From purity springs that singular beauty that permeates every sphere of reciprocal common life between human beings. And now comes a phrase that I, I is one of my favorite passages in the whole theology of the body, and allows them to express in it the simplicity and depth, the cordiality and unrepeatable authenticity of personal trust. You entrust yourself to another person. Dogs don't entrust themselves to each other. Persons entrust themselves to each other. In persons, sexual passion is profoundly different from what it is in animals. It's not as if we were a two-story building on the bottom floor, their animal passions, and on the top floor is rational thought. No, they're much more deeply one. In the next part of my talk, what I want to argue is that both Hildebrand and John Paul stand in deep continuity with the theological and philosophical tradition in this respect. And I take this to be the strength of their view. I don't take it to be necessarily a strength for somebody to present ideas nobody has ever heard of. Mm -hmm. um, most of philosophy is coming to know distinctly what children know already. And theology, likewise, is to come to know distinctly what simple believers believe in the creed. <coughs> so the continuity of the theological and philosophical tradition is one of its great strengths. And I think this is true about John Paul and Hildebrand. First, a text by John Paul on personalistic, sometimes that word is taken to be a word limited to a number of philosophical movements in the modern age. 
And it's true, as philosophical movements, they are new, they have their own physiognomy. But listen to what he says here. The words of the author of Ephesians seem to be, above all, a commentary on those older, original biblical words in which the nature of the sacramental sign of marriage finds its expression. The two will be one flesh. So Ephesians as a commentary on the two will be one flesh. And then Paul says, this mystery is great. I say so with reference to Christ and the church. You have the same perception of a depth, of a personal depth of, of mystery. This commentary is personalistic in the full meaning of the word. Paul and Genesis, personalistic in the full meaning of the word. Um, which was already shown in the early analyses of this text. The language of the liturgy is equally personalistic, both when we consider Tobit and when we consider the present liturgy of the church. Let me give a couple of examples from the tradition that, that show the continuity. There are texts, I think, that are helpful for understanding John Paul and Hildebrand, and vice versa. This is the great thing about the theological and philosophical tradition, that it's the traditional Catholic way of reading it backwards and forwards. Interpret past texts in light of the present, and vice versa. First Plotinus, born after, uh, the, um, yeah, after Christ, here he summarizes points in Plato's Phaedrus. A magnificent summary. Those who recognize in a perceptible image the portrait of someone treasured in their mind. So he's talking about love between persons and looking at a portrait, at the portrait of a person are thrilled when they come to this remembrance of truth. From this experience, the word there is pathos, um, hard to translate, loves are set in motion. And then he applies it. If someone who sees beauty well represented in a face is carried there, to the person, but not only to the person, but to beauty itself. Will he be inert in mind? Will he not be moved to anything else when he sees all that is beautiful in the world of sense, all commensurability, this great order, and the visible form, the eidos, apparent in the stars, though they are so far away? Will he not be moved from there to deep thought? Will awe not grip him? How? Whence? It's a way of looking at the, at the world with reverence, with a sense of the depth that's apparent, expressed, can be felt in the world. Most of Aristotle's dialogues are lost. They're only fragments preserved. Many of Plato's dialogues are preserved, but his in-school writings are lost. We have Aristotle's in-school writings, but none of his dialogues are complete. Here's a fragment that gives somewhat of a taste of what um, they were like. It's from Cicero on the nature of the gods. It's a single sentence, a very long sentence. But essentially, I think, the same thing that Plotinus says. If there were, although what's interesting about this text, it is a variation on Plato's image of the cave in the Republic with significant differences. 
If there were some who had always lived underground in good dwellings, filled with light, adorned with statues and pictures, and furnished with everything in which those abound who were thought supremely happy, who had nevertheless never gone out above ground, who had, however, heard and received a report that there was some governance and power of the gods, and who had then, it's interesting, the story comes first, the perception comes afterwards, the story about the gods comes first. And who had then, at some time, when the jaws of the earth opened, been able to escape from these hidden dwellings and come out into these places which we inhabit. Here's the difference from Plato's cave. The point of arrival is the world in which we live. When suddenly they saw the earth, the seas and the sky, understood the greatness of clouds and the power of winds, and looked at the sun and understood its greatness and beauty, but especially its causal power that it makes the day with light poured out over the whole sky. And when, by contrast, night darkened the earth, they saw the whole sky spangled and adorned with stars, and the changing phases of the moon's light waxing and waning, and the rising and setting of all these and their paths fixed in all eternity, and unchangeable, when they saw this, most certainly would they have judged that there are gods and that these great works are works of gods. So a similar perception. Not only to think that there are gods, but to see expressed in the beauty of the cosmos, the divine origin. Now this applies also to the understanding of marriage. The next text is from Aristotle's Economics from Book 3, which we have only in two independent Latin translations. And it may not be by Aristotle himself, but at any rate from the Aristotelian school. It is due to the gods before whom he offered sacred victims that he, the husband, led his wife home. And much more did he give himself over to her to honor her after his parents. A certain order preserved there. You can wonder, the man will leave father and mother and cling to his wife, whether that's in agreement with Genesis or not. But now nothing is greater, nothing more her own for a wife in relation to her husband than honorable and faithful communion. One translation says societas, the other communicatio, and the Greek may be koinonia, which is usually translated as communion. For there are two kinds of fear. One kind is linked with awe and a sense of shame, which is felt by sober and honorable sons toward their parents and well-ordered citizens toward good rulers. The other is linked with hostility and hatred, like slaves toward masters and citizens toward harmful and evil tyrants. Homer does not honor friendship or fear if a sense of awe is absent, but he tells us to love everywhere with modesty and a sense of awe, and to fear, as Helen puts it, when she says to Priam, this is really interesting. This goes back to Homer, 800 years before Christ. Um, it's, it's a deep human tradition. It's not made up by either Plato or Aristotle. To be feared and revered you are for me, and you fill me with awe, most beloved father-in-law. Father-in-law, sort of. She was taken by Paris from her husband. And again, Odysseus says this to Nausicaa, you woman, I am full of wonder about you, and I stand in awe of you. For Homer believes that this is the feeling of a husband and wife for one another, and that if they so feel, it will be well with them both. Very similar to the fundamental thesis of John Paul in The Theology of the Body, that 
in, in the last part of the book, when he talks about the spirituality, conjugal spirituality, that in some ways the center of conjugal spirituality is reverence. Reverence for God, <coughs> reverence for the divine in each other, reverence for the sacramental sign of marriage, etc. This perception also extends to generation. Human generation is not simply animal generation. There's something unique about it. In general, Aristotle has this to say about generation, and this applies also to animals. The most natural of the works belonging to living beings is to produce another like themselves. And now it comes. In order to participate in the eternal and divine, as far as they can, because all things strive for this, and do for the sake of it, whatever they do by nature. So the Platonic eros for the divine as something found in all natural things, the attraction of the good itself, of the divine, is what ultimately explains the natures of things. And in the meteorology, you have this remarkable statement. It's a double tangent. The meteorology talks about the weather. And in the context of talking about the weather, he talks about ripening of fruit. And then he asks, well, when is fruit ripe? And here comes the first tangent. The ripening of fruit is perfect when the seeds in it can produce another such as itself. For in all other cases as well, this is what we call perfect. To be perfect and to be self-communicative coincide. To be perfect is not primarily to rest in oneself, but to be self-communicative. This is used by many theologians in the tradition, Bonaventure, um, this principle in Aristotle, St. Thomas, St. Bonaventure, St. Thomas, as a way from a distance to illumine the mystery of the Trinity. If God is complete perfection, God must also be complete self-communication. And therefore, um, reverence shows up once again in St. Thomas's argument about contraception in particular. This is his argument in the Disputed questions on evil. Not only homicide, which takes away a man's life, is a mortal sin, but also theft, which deprives man of the exterior goods that are ordered to sustaining his life. The implicit premise here clearly is a human life is a good which ought not to be destroyed. And so scripture says, the bread of the needy is the life of the poor. The one who defrauds him of it is a man of blood. But more closely ordered to man's life than any external possessions is human semen, in which there is, or there exists, man in power, as, as in the cause. Hence the philosopher says in the politics that in man's semen there is something divine, because it is man in power. The first cause is particularly operative. The divine origin of things is particularly operative there. And so it's evident that every such act of sexual vice is a mortal sin by the kind of act it is, by genus. The argument turns on a perception that there's something more than human going on in procreation, that the divine cause of things is in some way present, should not be wounded, should not be set aside, 
It's a very different relationship to nature than our technological age has, where everything is just particles in motion and you do with them what you please. Just to complete the train of thought, the one ground of reverence for the person is an understanding, this is very clear in Vaitiva, an understanding of the person as having dominion over himself or herself. So they set goals, they yearn for a life which is good, they make choices for a life which is good, and therefore the only right way of relating to a person is to will their good, which is a root of reverence here on the person. Although the universal and the particular are found in all genera, still in a certain special way the individual is found in the genus of substance. So there are different ways of being individual, more general, more special. Individuals of substance therefore have some special name in contrast to others. They're called hypostases, that's the theological term, or first substances. In a still more special and perfect way, particular and individual are found in rational substances which have lordship over their own acts and are not merely acted like other things but act through themselves. Actions, however, are in singulars. The premise here seems to be, as something acts, so it is. It acts from its being. If you act from yourself, you are from yourself in a unique way. It's a test. Actions are testimonies of the person. That's the method of Vatiba's book on person and act. And so, substances of rational nature have a special name, and this name is person. The same point shows up again at the beginning of the second part of the Summa, which is the perspective under which the whole of morality is to be seen. The whole second part of the Summa is about the moral life. And he appeals to the Greek fathers. So this is not an invention of his, this is deep in the in the tradition, received by him, as it's then received by John Paul. Since, as John Damascene says, man is made to the image of God, inasmuch as image signifies what has understanding, free choice, and power through itself, per se potestativum. Aut ex usion is probably the Greek, um, you had it. We should now deal with God's image, with man, inasmuch he is the beginning of his acts, as having free choice and power over his own acts. Suorum operum potestatum. That was part two of my talk, in which my aim was to show the deep continuity between Hildebrandt, John Paul on the one side, and the philosophical theological tradition. For a theologian, maybe this is a matter, of course, this is what theologians, if they have their head screwed on, um, look toward. Because what you want is continuity with the teaching of Jesus, continuity with scripture, continuity with the great fathers and doctors of the church. <clears throat> 